I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Back with another episode with AJ Jacobs on Good or Bad. AJ, welcome to the show. This one is the Olympics, good or bad. And normally when I think of the Olympics, I only think of good. Like it's this thing we all, every... Every two years, basically, because, you know, the summer and winter rotate. Every two years, we tune in. We get so excited. Who's going to win? Who's going to win the gold medal? And you feel so inspired by these acts of incredible athleticism. What could be bad? So there's lots of good, but let's trash the Olympics for a few minutes before we get to the good. Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Well, and and, and I just want to mention, for each bad that you're going to mention, later on we'll discuss the good side of it, but I encourage the listener to challenge our thinking on the bad a little bit while they're listening to this. There you go. All right. So the first bad for me as a nerd, I find the, the glorifying the physical over the mental to be troubling. Like why, why, uh, why is there no chess? Why is there no chess? In although, the although for many, many years, uh, so the, so the Olympics, I think there's about 204 countries involved. So the International Chess Organization, which is called FIDE, uh, is has 189 countries involved, and it's taken very seriously in each country. And they've really been lobbying the Olympics to include them. Uh, up until now, the Olympics have considered it, but have not included them. And for 2024, it's still being considered. I don't know if it's likely or not, but there's a, a, a very, I think it, this it's the most respectable push by the chess organization to be included in the Olympics. So really? I think it will happen. It might happen. Well, have you ever seen on YouTube, you ever watch uh, chess boxing? No. Oh, it's awesome. It what is chess boxing? Well, they do one round of boxing and then they sit down and play five minutes of chess and then they do another round of and, boxing. And are these, <laughs> is, the, is, is the boxing or the chess good? Is it mostly boxers who play chess or chess players who That's box? That's a good question. I have not researched it deeply enough, but uh, I do just love the idea of, you know, they're Maybe bashing that could be their my brains. first Olympic sport. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They're doing brain damage, and then they're trying to use their brains. Um, so maybe that's the solution. So, um, But you were saying before we recorded that actually in the early history of the modern Olympics, like the 1900s, they actually did have some non- uh, athletic sport. Uh, yeah, there was uh, architecture, literature, <laughs> uh, there was uh, music, painting, and sculpture. And I think these were abandoned in the 1954 uh, Olympics. But 
there was there was medals awarded for all of these all of these things, and they were in, in the competitions were inspired by sport. And in fact, the very first so organizer like, of the Olympics, oh yeah, Baron Pierre Coubertin, uh, submitted for I think it was for literature under an assumed name, and he won the gold medal. That is, and what was do you know what the writing was about? No, I don't know because it all had to be sports themed, right? So it was like paintings of a rugby player. I saw one. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that part. But that makes sense. I mean, on the one hand, that is insane because how can you judge what is the greatest work of the, I, to me? I mean, we can do an episode on award shows, but it is kind of crazy to try to quantify art as this is the best. But this is but the second but best. that's very common though. Like Pulitzer prizes, uh, True. It, every the Booker Prize, the National Book Award, uh, tons of art, you know, fellowships and foundations. Uh, so that's, that's common in, in the world to judge works of art. And in the Olympics for sports, we judge ice skating. We judge synchronized swimming. Yeah. So, you're right. you know, you're right. there's, there's a lot of subjectivity in, in the judging, which could be considered under the bad too. And remember back in the days, the joke was the East German judge was always giving the American a four out of 10 because they had a grudge. What's to incentivize judges not to do that? That's a great question. And, and, you know, considering that the difference between gold and silver on the career aspirations of the athletes is so important, uh, any kind of incentive to to be unfair is really critical for people. It's yeah. almost like people should ignore the medals because there's always going to be some slight, not, call, not corruption necessarily, but bias. Maybe it should be like, you know, gym class for third graders and everyone gets a gold medal. The, the whole world is moving towards a participation yeah, trophy. Yeah, participation trophy. Hey, it's because here's the thing. I I have nothing against Life is pretty hard. If my third grade kid gets a participation trophy, <laughs> I will <laughs> applaud him or her because believe me, when he's 25, it's, it's not. There's no participation trophies anymore. <laughs> so let them get a trophy when they're younger. <laughs> what about nationalism and tribalism because it's all about uh what country can beat what other country and uh i think we're in an era where the world's problems like climate change are not national problems we've got to work together so is this sending a wrong message about how important nations are well well it's interesting because i think part if you look at the two original inspirations for the Olympics back in 1896, uh, and not the ancient Olympics in Greece, but the modern Olympics kind of based on those, the two inspirations are um, how sports and education should be encouraged and having this inspirational international event will encourage more sports among youth and in education. And the other inspiration is peace, bringing you know, even countries that are in conflict with each other kind of have to have a little truce in order to participate against each other in the Olympics. So there's there's this globalist objective in the Olympics, but often that comes out in this national sway, the most extreme being 1936, when Hitler, of course, and the Olympics were in Berlin, Hitler viewed the Olympics as his Olympics and wanted to use it as a platform to show that you know the the mo the then modern German was superior to everyone else, and right. uh, and you know we it's fascinating when you look down the boycotts of the Olympics. Each Olympics, I think of the main ones like 1936, or you know during the wars, or or 1980 when we boyc boycotted because of Russia's invasion of Afghanistan. But it, it turns out every single Olympics has some mm. nationalist based boycotting, but. I, I think again, it's like it mirrors the world. There's this kind of constant um, battle between nationalism and globalism. And Yuval Harari points out in *Sapiens* how the world has been, in general, moving towards globalism. You know, we've moved, moved from the tribe to the village to the kingdom to the empire to nation states to you know potentially uh, you know worldwide companies, organizations like. Facebook, which has 2 billion members around the world and and potential currencies like Bitcoin, which is a more international currency or the EU, which you know threw away all the uh, trade barriers between European countries. 
But then you have a little bits of nationalism like Brexit and, you know, Trump being a bit more or a lot more isolationist than other prior U.S. presidents. So I think it's the, the Olympics kind of mirrors the the general trend towards globalism, but, you know, occasional backlashes of, of nationalism. Yeah. I think a lot about nationalism. There are probably lots of good things about it. Generally, my gut is more in the Yuval Sam Harris uh uh, camp that we need to eventually move beyond uh, nationalism so that national that nations almost treat each other like you know New Jersey and Pennsylvania like it's no big deal yeah I like the idea of getting all the countries all people people from all over the world together but how else could you split it up besides nations and my mother suggested why don't you do it by last name, like at a bar mitzvah or a gym class, like people with the names A through C are in one team and D through might be a little, you know. I, I wonder know. if some nations have a bigger proportion of letters than others, so it ends up being a nationalist. Yeah, that, it would be complicated. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious how tribal we are. And, you know, those experiments where they take kids and put them in two different colored T-shirts and that they just start hating on each other. But just thinking like when I watch like the soccer or like the World Cup and I feel it a little bit, even though I don't watch a single game, if someone <laughs> tells me the U.S. is playing Italy, like somewhere deep inside me, I want the U.S. to win. Even though I've never played soccer, I don't care about the World Cup, I don't feel anything towards the sport, I still want the U.S. to win. And it's not like I'm involved in any way at all it's not like i can say we won but people say we won <laughs> i agree i like every four years or every two years when the olympics come like my patriotism reaches a peak this will, will never happen but maybe it would be good for world peace if if they all participated if it was like one big amish barn raising so instead of competing they're all cooperating they can build the they can all comp build like this the Olympic Stadium, like the two weeks, and they all build. Absolutely, no one would watch that because they I like feel competition. Like the, I feel like the UN is supposed to be like an intellectual Olympics version of that. Mm. Like they're all supposed to cooperate to create for the one goal of making a better world, and it doesn't really work out that way. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, all right, another bad is. They are rife with cheating and corruption. And and is it so baked into the Olympics that there is just no way you'll ever get a clean Olympics and it's so bad that we should just say give up? Your entire childhood, from like the age of five to let's say 20, you're, you're told if you work really hard and do really well, you're going to achieve national or international prominence in your favorite sports. So you work hard, hard, hard. It's the only thing you focus on. It's the only thing you do to, to the, um, you know, you leave behind everything else and you just focus on, on your one sport and your parents push you and your teachers push you and your coaches push you. And then finally at the age of 20, when you're hitting that peak professional level, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, if you want to move any further, you need to talk to this doctor and start doing what everyone else is secretly quietly doing which is this illegal doping and by then it's too late you're you're all you've done your entire life is this sport and you've had this one dream and so you do it because that's what everyone you're told that's what everyone else is doing and there's nothing else for you to do you you haven't focused on anything else in your life so he says that's how he and many others and many olympic athletes get trapped into doping so it's an interesting it, it is a bad thing that there's that there's this corruption and that there's cheating and and it ends up being a competition who who have the who has the best scientists i mean one crazy solution is just say uh, all bets are off Ever, let everyone dope as much as they want yeah i actually agree with that for because a it it communicates correctly and honestly to children who are about to and parents and coaches and teachers who are about to make this major push for a child to be a success in some sport that he or she shows talent in, it tells them honestly what what is involved at a, at a professional or at a peak performance level. And two, it might encourage better research. I mean, you there is a line on doping where above that line, you could die. Uh, and below that, because the doping is so much, the drugs are so much in your system. And, and maybe there are benefits to scientific research on these drugs like let's reduce side effects maybe you can have 
better performance of all humans uh, and, and reduction of side mm-hmm. effects if there's if there's more concerted research on doping because it's because now it's legal so it's encouraged the other thing is let let's say you know these olympics are making these athletes are making their choices and even though i said they're encouraged to do so and there's bias to do so maybe the olympics becomes this is one big you know laboratory of you know which doping is safe and which isn't certainly we do we allow football players that the national football league is one giant ex- test tube about concussions Mm. so you know is that any different than what's happening what's already (laughs) happening in the olympics but secretly i like it you're just pro science you're just that's all you i am and i'm also but i'm also pro performance and if there's a way to to enhance performance in any area of life that's safe scientifically researched and even encouraged i i think that should be pursued look every most high school students now, there's so much pressure to get into a good college. You see their parents doing, you know, illegal, you know, paying SAT, you know, for SAT scores to be cheated and, and whatever. So, so, and every kid takes Adderall when they're taking their SATs, when they're taking their AP tests. My kids are doing homework until four in the morning. Sometimes it's insane. It's so much more than when we were kids. And, you know, so, so there's certainly there's doping in other areas of life. I, 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 I think because it is considered legal and acceptable and even a positive in other areas of life, why can't we find the right balance where it's positive in sports? I, it's fascinating. I feel I should just stick up for doping as maybe not the greatest thing for the, the I got to throw that in or else we're going to get a hundred emails. But, but, so, but what's your reason? Well, I would say the critics would say it's dangerous. Your testicles shrink to the size of a raisin. It is a cheating in a sense that if the goal is to see how much you as an individual can excel, uh, then having a scientist shoot you with drugs, that's, uh, that takes away all of the fun and naturalness of this competition, because then it's all about who has the better scientist. I, I agree with you in an ideal world, just like in an ideal world, the Olympics should lead to world peace and partnership and so on. But the reality is, even if doping is bad, better to be honest that, hey, you're probably gonna be encouraged to illegally dope, and the people who are illegally doping are probably gonna beat you. Because <laughs> all things being equal, even for kids, if if, Two kids have the exact same educational background and IQ. One takes Adderall, the other doesn't. The one taking Adderall will probably do better on the SATs that day. And so, <laughs> mm-hmm. so you're not going to be able to avoid this kind of corruption, sometimes legally, sometimes illegally. So yes, I agree with you. You're right. In an ideal world, it feels like cheating. It feels like it's not a fair test of skill and, and hard work and, and talent and endurance. But on the other hand, it's it's happening and there's nothing we can do about it. And the scientists are always going to stay one step ahead of the people trying to stop it. Interesting. Well, I did hear, I like this argument I heard from someone, I can't remember who made it, but he said, you we're never, we're never going to have a fully sanitized room. There are always going to be some germs in it. But that doesn't mean that we should do surgery in a sewer. So there's always going to be some doping, but should we fight against it? So it could be the case that there's just nothing we can do about it and it already is happening. I agree with you. Again, I will, I will state for the record that doping doesn't seem like a good thing. It feels like cheating. At the same time, there's, there's reality and maybe, there, maybe we should focus on what could potential medical long-term benefits be of, of studying these things. I just had a good idea though. Maybe there should be a separate competition for the scientists who come up with these drugs. So like you get a gold medal if you develop a steroid that increases performance by like 8% versus 7%. Yeah, and I guess I guess that's what the Olympics would be if doping was legal because <laughs> then the scientists would be up front getting, you know, sitting next to the gold medal yeah. winner. I had this new anabolic steroid. It's incredible. It's four and a half percent increase. I think we've got a great idea. Like you have the platform, you have the athlete, and then you have the scientist right next to 
him on the platform getting his own gold or her own gold medal. Yeah, it's a very much a gray area. What is doping? And actually, I loved researching the history of cheating and doping because um, in the first Olymp modern Olympics in Athens in, was it 1896? Yeah. Um, the winner of the marathon stopped at a cafe and had a glass of wine to keep him going. I'm really? Not, I'm not sure wine is really... Versus coffee. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, he might have. Uh, but no, but he had wine. And, uh, and I, I also heard, was, did you hear this too? And I think it was in the 1900 or 1904 Olympics, one, I think it was a marathon runner, runner was given strychnine. Mm. And I'm not quite sure why. Is that an I saw that. That was hilarious. Yeah, they, they mistakenly thought that that was like going to help him. But... I think it just nearly Kill killed him. <laughs> I mean, my favorite was in the 1968 games in Mexico City, there was a Swedish pentathlete who confessed that for the pistol shooting competition, he drank two beers to calm his nerves. And I just think anytime you combine alcohol, firearms, and competition, it's a great no idea. idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so in addition to cheating, there's also corruption. I don't think we need to get into it too deeply, but, I mean, there are all these stories of the Olympic Committee being bribed by everything from school tuition to uh, hospital bills for their family so that they'll vote for a certain city. Like the Salt Lake City Olympics in 2002 were notorious for the corruption. Not to mention the bribes once a city gets the Olympics. You know, there's all you know, there's all sorts of bridges to nowhere that are built. You know, with the Olympic funds. Mm. I mean, the a modern Olympics could cost, I don't know, up to forty billion dollars to to put on in terms of like all the infrastructure that has to be created, and so that's a lot of a lot of people becoming incredibly wealthy. Like. We think like, oh, an Olympics costs forty billion dollars, and that's this abstract number. But that forty billion dollars ends up in the hands of real people, and those people go from being, you know, mediocre businessmen to potentially billionaires. I want to get to the business in one second, but yeah, some people make buttloads of money from the Olympics. Some people lose buttloads of money. So it's all where you stand. But the um, but I did hear one quote, you know, the reason they only hold the Olympics every four years is because it takes them that long to count the money. So there are people like hotel developers and, uh, and, and tourism companies and, uh, and stadium builders who are just raking it in. And there are other people who are incredible losers uh, for the, uh, that we can talk. But I, I wanted to pick up on one thing that you had mentioned about these athletes who devote their entire lives to this one, you know, whether it's 30 seconds or 10 minutes of, uh, of competition in the Olympics. And what is that like? Uh, because, you know, you're making these sacrifices in every other part of your life, academic, social, dating. And then, you, you know, what if you have a bad day, you eat a, you know, you eat a bad taco that morning and you, uh, you miss your pole vault and and that's it. I mean, can you imagine the crushing uh, despair that that would cause? So is this are the Olympics actually good for athletes or are they bad for athletes? I did read another article by an Olympic athlete that shows the just the cost of, of this. And she said she was a gymnast. Her name is Caitlin Ohashi, and she wrote about how, the Olympics was the ultimate goal, but it wasn't my goal. It was my my family and the coaches, and she was miserable. She said that she, by the end, was uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally broken, and she had she had to eat 500 calories a day, like just raspberries, and then do these incredibly difficult uh, physical challenges. And she quit. She quit. And it does have a happy ending because she joined her college gymnastics team, and she did this uh, did this routine that on that went viral because she was it was to my Michael Jackson song, and she was just having a good time, not caring, smiling. She wasn't so serious as she was going for the gold, and people were like, "Oh, you can actually have fun doing uh, gymnastics. It doesn't have to be so." Uh, so she's an example of how. 
these athletes are sometimes miserable. And, and you know, you're, you're talking about Olympic athletes, but there's not only the, the Olympics affects not only Olympic athletes, there are the many, many multiples of uh, Olympic driven athletes who don't make it to the Olympics who are crushed and disappointed. You know, they're pushed initially by parents and coaches and teachers, and then they're just crushed because they don't make it or they have an injury and it just, they've spent 10 years of their life, maybe from six to 16, training for something. And they're only, they only make it regionally good or they don't quite qualify or they have an injury or they have anorexia, which happens in a lot of cases with like ice skating or gymnastics or track and field. So, uh, you know, I think it not only applies to the Olympic athletes, it applies to all these child athletes who are being pushed towards the Olympics and don't make it. So there's there's depression, there's physical stress and injury, there's anorexia, there's all sorts of complications. But what's a positive benefit for being an Olympic athlete? There are at least uh, two that occur to me. One is just the feeling of being the best in the best 0.1% of your chosen skill. I mean, that must be an amazing feeling. I've never had that feeling, but it must be an amazing feeling. But but yes, you should have that feeling, right? So every one of your books has been on the New York Times bestseller list, well, which means you're in the point, top 0.001% of books sold, but right. it's all relative, right? But the second advantage of being an Olympic athlete is not for the athlete themselves, but for the inspiration they provide to other people. So I we, agree with that, but that's a positive to the Olympics. I have like one more bad part before we get to the good parts. One, critics talk about this a lot, that the Olympics are just terrible for the disadvantaged, vulnerable parts of the population. So some people are making buttloads of money. But on the other hand, every city that has the Olympics, they displace the poor people, because uh, they don't want them on TV. So they... Even in the U.S., I, I forget which city it was. Maybe it was Atlanta. They moved 25,000 homeless people to, like, another city. And there's there's a lot of argument about wasted funds. Like, they build these stadiums that are never used again. So they, they might build a stadium for a billion dollars, and it's never used again. Uh, there's... Right, the Bird's Nest Stadium in China is, like, this gorgeous thing, and it is just uh, sits empty almost all the time and costs $11 million a year. To, to keep up. But I think, I, I, I look at it two ways. There's kind of microeconomic benefits and disadvantages, which is, does the do the Olympics themselves show a profit or a loss mm -hmm. that year? And is there corruption or no corruption around the Olympics that year? So right. that's one issue. But then there's a macroeconomic issue, which is that, in, in you know, it's a, it's a multi-year maybe even a decade long process of getting the rights to host the Olympics in your city. So many cities compete and often cities in order to win the Olympics, they'll spend billions of dollars boosting their infrastructure, like improving roads, improving bridges, building buildings, building hotels. So that creates draw, uh, jobs and spurs economic growth uh, on a macro level. It's hard to kind of measure. This is because of the Olympics, but on a, on a macro economic level, there are sometimes tens of billions of dollars being spent on things that are only positive for the city. Increases jobs, builds infrastructure, and who knows what else benefits. The other thing is often cities and countries, in order to win the Olympics, will signal that they're good actors in the world domain and will, will um, lift trade barriers so they're more friendly with other countries. And so that has a, a global economic effect and even a, a countrywide uh, economic effect that, again, can't be uh, quantified exactly uh, how much of it traces to the Olympics, but does have a positive effect. I feel like macroeconomically, due to the importance of the Olympics, there's a, a net positive. There's economic growth around a country in and around the year that they're hosting the Olympics. But probably on a microeconomic level, there's a lot of corruption, most Olympics seem to have lost money overall, although some have made money, like um, Salt Lake City made money. There's a couple Olympics that have that have made money, uh, and but you know then it's, you can say that's like any major event. Yeah, well, it's interesting. From my research, it's really hard to tell whether it's a good idea for a, a country to host the Olympics. From and macroeconomically, you're talking they're spending billions of dollars. Um, 
and they're hoping that the tourism and the, their brand will increase. From, from my research, it seems that it depends on how well the Olympics are run. So some countries did great, like Los Angeles. It turned a profit, and it got all this good infrastructure and roads. Um, on the other hand, you've got the, um, the Greek Olympics, which some say was so bad. This is the Athens, the, the Olympics in Athens in 2004. Some say it was so bad that the debt they incurred helped cause this crazy economic crisis. But when you're talking on a macroeconomic level, it's sort of like the Olympics is a form of quantitative easing. You know, similar to let's say an extreme level, similar to the 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 bailout of banks in two thousand nine, where money is just simply printed and given to the economy. And so, in the U.S., that tends to work for whatever reason. In Greece, for a lot of complicated reasons, it doesn't work. Or China, it may or may not work. It's it's unclear because of the shady numbers. But I think I think in general, on a macroeconomic level, you have to work. You have to look at does quantitative does quantitative easing work for this country or does it simply increase debt levels or does it increase inflation or or whatever? Because when billions are spent, that means billions are made. Someone is making every one of those dollars and then they in turn spend those dollars. They buy new houses, they hire construction workers, they buy new cars. So, so just in general, that should have a net positive on the economy, but there's, there's negative side effects too and it gets too complicated yeah. to, to measure. Well, I know critics would argue that there really is very little trickle-down effect from these Olympics. So when you improve the infrastructure of a city, for instance, like in Rio, it wasn't like they were building roads so that poor people could get to their work. They were building roads from the airport to the fancy hotels. So that's helping some people, but it's not... It, yeah, so it's making the rich richer, um, but everyone else gets screwed. Right, and it depends, too... When there's corruption in particular, it depends to what the rich are doing with the money. So mm -hmm. like if they then take the money and hide it in Swiss bank accounts, then that doesn't affect the economy at all. It's a net negative on the economy. So again, it, it, it sort of depends on the level of corruption involved as well. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes. I'm try. I, I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half, and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. <laughs> Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at MizzenandMaine.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James, that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like. I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. 
So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game-like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious, like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best, from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Well, I have plenty of other things that I can trash the Olympics with, but I feel bad for the Olympics. I feel we should start talking about the good because there is plenty of good. And can I tell you my favorite good thing to come out of the Olympics? Yes. Is all of the sex that the Olympic athletes have at the Olympic Village. And it is 
Apparently, it's just like an orgy. It's like a free. It's like Woodstock. And um, I feel like this is a negative. You do because a. I feel like a little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's negative for you. It, there's like a little bit of sexual jealousy there. And B, I wonder how many divorces occur as a result of Olympic frolicking. Ah. So, they're, so they're, they're, whatever, their testosterone and energy is, right. is revving up so much. What was the number on the number of condoms given out at the last Olympics? Oh, yeah. It is unbelievable the amount of con- And at the Rio Olympics, Brazil handed out 450,000 condoms to the Olympic Village. That is 42 condoms per athlete. And they're, and they're uh, using uh, them, right? The reason they hand out that much is because the prior Olympics, 100,000 condoms were bought and disposed of <laughs> in the first week. I do think that you could argue the Olympics are a huge force for good, for progress, for going in the right direction. And I'm thinking about women, for instance. Uh, in the in the beginning of the Olympics, women were not allowed to participate. In fact, in the ancient Greek Olympics, women were not only not allowed to participate, they weren't allowed, allowed to attend. A married woman attending the Olympics was a capital offense. She would be executed. So we've come pretty far from that. So why would they be executed? Wouldn't they just be stopped at the door like no women? Or would women sneak in? Women sneak in dressed as men, I wow. think. So... Um, but then you've seen progressively more and more women, and we're almost at 50-50. And I think what's great is that there's this global pressure to include women. So you had some holdouts. There were 35 countries who were still sending all male teams in the 1992 Olympics. But they faced so much international pressure that, for instance, Saudi Arabia finally, in 2012, sent their first female Olympics, a, a judo uh, competitor and a track and field. I, I wonder how they did, because I wonder if they got the same level of training when they were younger. It's a good question. I don't think they won the, the medal, but <laughs> they, they, you know, at least they're in there. And I love that. And, and same with, with race. Uh, the, some argue that the IOC sanctions ha- helped to end South African apartheid. So you want to appear... Uh, you don't want to embarrass yourself on a world stage. Right. And, so. and, and this is related to your earlier point about globalism. Like I think on this one, like you say, this world stage, everyone's in plain view to billions of viewers now on, on television. And you don't want to embarrass yourself. Like you want to uh, participate according to the standards of most of the world. And so there's this, there's this unique world pressure to, uh, you know, Join, join the rest of the community, get rid of apartheid, or have women participate. So in the 2016 Olympics, the highest rate of female participation was almost 50-50. It was about 46% uh, of, of the athletes were female, which was the highest ever. Yeah, it's like peer pressure for good. And, and you figure that's t- it, very inspiring to uh, women, particularly in these uh, more oppressive countries, it shows girls, little girls, that, oh, I can achieve the heights of peak performance. I, I don't have to be uh, stopped by my country's laws or those laws are changing. So there's there's hope. Yeah, I love that. And and maybe there is some world peace that can come out of this. I You know, there was the North and South Korea marched under one flag at the 2018 Olympics, which was huge. Another good thing I like, you talked about this. The inspiration. I mean, some of these stories are just crazy. Yeah, like I was, I was reading one story. Um, there was this in 1960. There was this uh, Olympic runner, a sprinter uh, from Ethiopia, uh, a baby uh, Bikila, Bikila, a baby Bikila, who uh, he he goes to the Rome Olympics in 1960 from Ethiopia. He goes to the Rome. Uh, Olympics. First off, his his whole story is great. When he was a kid, I didn't even know this existed. There's a game in Ethiopia that's like hockey, but instead of the goalposts being, let's say, 50 or 100 yards apart, they're miles apart. Huh? So you have to do this extreme running, you know, for long distances to play, even play this game. And so he grew up playing this game. Then he takes a job with the Ethiopian Imperial Guard guarding the emperor. He it's it's 11 miles from his home. So every day he runs to work. <laughs> 
you know, because tra- he there's no transportation. He run in 1960. He runs to work 11 miles and runs home. So he builds up in this weird way this training for uh, you know, marathons or what I I forget the yeah he was a long distance runner, but I forget the exact sport that he won the gold medal in. Anyway, he uh, gets to Rome. He buys sneakers. He didn't have sneakers even, so he buys sneakers, but they didn't fit. They caused blisters, and I guess he couldn't afford another pair of sneakers or didn't think to buy another pair of sneakers, so he runs barefoot and wins the gold medal. And, you know, ever so a couple things. One is, ever since, East Africa has kind of dominated uh, these particular sports in the Olympics and because he was such an inspiration throughout Africa. I mean, there's statues of him. And then it, it took a sad turn, although you could argue still inspirational, uh, many years or several years later, he had a car accident. He became paralyzed. Uh, he was paraplegic. He could use his arms. But then he started participating in sports like ping pong, mm. which he could participate in, which ultimately, you know, this led to like Special Olympics and Paralympics and so on. And, you know, he died at an early age because of this accident at the age of 41. He, he passed away. But this, he sort of, kind of kickstarted many inspirational stories. Are the rights available? Because I'm going to make that into a movie. I mean, that is There has been documentaries on him. Oh, yeah. And uh, But again, I feel like if you look at any Olympics, there's probably many inspirational stories. Like, that's one. You know, then there's there's stories like Jesse Owens, Jim Thorpe in the U.S. There's, you know, there's so many inspirational stories. I saw in the 1904 Olympics in St. Louis, the guy who won the gold medal in uh, gymnastics was an American gymnast who had his leg amputated because of a train accident. So he competed with a wooden leg and wow. he won. I don't oh my think, gosh. Yeah. The other movie I watched in preparation was Miracle about the United States uh, hockey team in the 1980 Olympics that uh, beat the Russians. And uh, and it was like, you know, un unheard of russia was they were all these professionals and these were just a bunch of college kids and you know super inspiring i do take issue with the name the miracle because it was named after al michaels the, who said at, at the end when they won he said do you believe in miracles and the whole movie was about it wasn't a miracle these guys worked their asses off so so the question is with stories like that or stories like when um I think it was 1996 when the the NBA players who were on the uh, mm. U.S. Olympics basketball team lost. It, with stories like that, it's interesting to study and break down, like you say, what did they do? How did their training methods improve or change uh, in order to conquer the the best in the world? I think looking at the Olympics is also a way to study how coaching and training and peak performance and understanding of peak performance evolves so that somebody can go from being underdog to the best yeah. or or how do the best not train correctly in order to to fall huge like with the with these professional basketball players right. so i i think st- stories like that are 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 interesting from not only an inspirational point of view but from a scientific point of view well i think the thesis that i've heard is that these hockey players worked as a team they were not as talented individually as the soviets but because they trained, they were so much about not being egotistical. And it was all about the team. There is no I in team. And and the problem with the dream team in basketball, the U.S. players, was that they were all these individuals, but they never had played together. So they didn't know how to work as a team. I, I will say one other thing that, that yeah. is a positive on the Olympics, which we we briefly touched on, but the, the focus on amateurs. So hmm. technically speaking, it's not a it's not a professional game. Athletes historically were not paid to participate. Now many countries do pay uh, their medalists, but I don't think the U.S. does. For I'm not sure actually, but uh, historically it's been for amateurs only, not for professionals of any sort. And I think that comes stems from the roots of the of the modern games in the 1890s when. Uh, the the idea that this should inspire more sports and exercise in education and let's show it on a global scale the benefits of you know physical health and and performance and have that inspire kids and so i think the focus on on amateurs even though that's been distorted by both professionalism and by 
doping and cheating and so on, I think the initial focus on amateurism is is good. It shows everybody you can achieve something in life, whether you're a professional or an amateur. Yeah. And you could derive pleasure from it. Like you don't have to be the best puzzle maker in the world. You could still derive pleasure from pursuing excellence in something. Right. And then, I mean, and that ties into this, this idea of, of these little known sports that you don't see for 47 months of the year. Uh, I mean, that you don't see for 47 months in a row, but then they have their moment in the sun. And these people are, are not necessarily making a living from their sport, but it's just so fun to see them get their little, uh, that their little moments in the limelight. Yeah. And to, and to our earlier point, again, so many of them, those other 47 months are forgotten while they're in training for the next Olympics. So some of them are in food stamps. Some uh, some of them are in food stamps and work uh, at part-time jobs because they have to spend most of their time in training. Uh, hundreds of them have, hundreds of these athletes, even medalists, uh, have GoFundMes to, to uh, uh, pay for their gym and training. So we're going to, this proceeds of this episode are going towards... Uh, uh, whatever athletes we could find out there who have these these GoFundMe's. Love it. Yeah, I think those are, the, to me, those are the two nice takeaways of this. One, that we can help some, like, curlers, to go back to curling, who, who need money. And two, I think our idea of a science Olympics where you give gold medals to people who develop the best performance-enhancing drugs, I think there's a, I think that's a business idea right there. I think it is, and I think it's just good to shed light on something that is universally adored, but there are always issues. It's it's There's always a gray area, hence the Good or Bad podcast. There you go. 